Okay, I have an indication that we seem to be recording, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I have a bunch of notes that I made to myself about things that I wanted to mention to all of you. Uh, so on the class webpage, there's a link here to the course survey. I, I had sent this out last Sunday, I think, and asked you guys to fill that out. Most of you have done that, which is great. If you haven't had a chance yet to do that, that would be good uh, to go ahead and do that. Uh, and I'm gonna continue to be updating every day the most recent lecture and the most recent question of the day. Um, the question for today was, uh, uh, what do you wear when you're watching lecture? And so these are the results for that. Uh, maybe we'll make it a, a little bit bigger. Uh, the normal school clothes, we got around 21%. Pajamas uh, seems to be the most popular, 38%. 13 wearing formal wear, so good for you. Uh, and 38% just about wearing sweats. So that was the question for today. Someone had asked me whether the uh, an anonymous feedback, whether these questions are uh, required, and the answer is no. It's, it's meant to be a little bit of a fun thing, but uh, I was really pleased to see that so many of you uh, went ahead and did this. So I hope we can continue to have a nice high response rate for these different questions of the day. Uh, they're they're uh, a nice little diversion from the other stuff that we're gonna do. Um, we are using a message board this quarter, uh, which is an ed message board, and I have a couple of TAs who set that up yesterday. They included a welcome message. They're gonna be watching the message board. So there's a link to it here on the side navigation. There's also a link to it up here. So that would be a good place to go if you have any questions you wanna ask about the course or about homework. Uh, there's also uh, a social section, a general section. So uh, we can go ahead and start using the message board uh, if you're interested. It is a moderated board because sometimes people post things to the message board that we, that we don't want them to post. So uh, uh, there might be a slight delay in your message appearing because uh, they, we want to have one of the TAs verify that that's an okay message to go to the message board. So if you see a slight delay in your message being posted, don't be surprised. That's because we're doing a moderated board. Um, sections happened yesterday. So I had set up this uh, tab here for Zoom links uh, and uh, uh, what I have on that right now uh, is the link for my office hours. Uh, we're going to be on Tuesdays 1 to 3, and then the links to all of the sections. So I hope that worked for you guys. I, I didn't get any desperate emails, so I think, it, I think it worked for most people, which is good. Um, I also wanted to show you that uh, I have a little tab here for sections. So uh, we're going to put materials here for section. We're trying to... Um, deal with the fact that we're not meeting in person. Normally, uh, in a section, we'd pass out a, a physical handout for you, and uh, uh, there's several things that are in that handout. So it includes a cheat sheet. So this is something that the TAs have developed over time, you know, just kind of little reminders of what it is we've covered that week. Uh, so these cheat sheets are a nice resource. You might want to consider printing them and saving copies of those cheat sheets. So normally you'd get it in a section handout, but we're not doing that. So uh, I'm gonna be posting the cheat sheets here as a PDF so you can see it. And if you want to, you can go ahead and print it. And then normally we have a set of problems, you know, that are on this uh, written uh, handout that we give to people. We don't have that option this quarter. So what we're doing instead is putting all of the section problems into practice it. So these are links to this system we have called Practice It, where you can actually uh, type in an answer and have Practice It checked to see whether you have the correct answer. So this week, I'm, I'm, uh, I expect the TAs mostly spent time just getting to know each other and knowing the Zoom and all of that, so they probably didn't do any of these problems. Uh, but So this is going to be a nice resource too. Even in a week when we're going over problems, they're not going to go over all the problems. There's not enough time to do everything. So we like giving you some extra problems. So this is a nice resource. If you want to be doing some extra practice, you know, that's a nice resource for it. And there will be a key posted each week that has answers to the questions that are here. Uh, I would recommend that you not take a, a look at the key early, that you, you try working out the questions on your own, because I think they're more valuable when you do it that way. Um, we normally have associated with this class uh, a lab opportunity, CSE 190, we call it. So uh, 142 is a four unit court course. You can sign up for a fifth unit uh, through this 190 lab opportunity. 
Um, and uh, we have labs that we've developed that are kind of self-paced things that you work through. Uh, uh, this is the link to lab one. If you click on this, you'll see that it brings up you know, a set of slides where it describes to you what to do and you kind of go next, next, next to go through the different slides and there's problems to solve uh, that are related to what we've been covering in lecture and so forth. So I didn't want us to try to start this week. So that's why we didn't do lab one on Tuesday of this week. Uh, we're going to start the labs next Tuesday. Uh, it's probably going to take us until Monday to be able to have it all set up. So don't try uh, signing up for it just yet. I will send an email to the class when the 190 lab signups are available. So we're working on that. We're trying to get TA volunteers to cover the different sections, get everything set up right uh, uh, for you to be able to register for labs. So normally something like half the students in the class do the lab. Uh, it's an optional thing. It's not required. It's, it's uh, basically it's extra practice with things that we're going over in lecture. Uh, so if you'd like to have an opportunity to do a bit of extra practice, uh, then the lab would be something that would probably be of interest to you. And you get a unit of, you know, pass-fail credit. It's not a graded credit. If you wanted to, if you wanted to kind of think about whether this is something that you want to do, you might want to check out Lab 1. So, I mean, as I said, we didn't do it this week because uh, uh, we didn't have time to get everything set up. But there's no reason you couldn't just kind of work through it on your own. We won't give you any credit for it, but it's a, it's a way of seeing what the labs are like, uh, kind of having a sense of, of, of that. So, um, in any event, if you're interested, you could kind of do the lab. And um, I wanted to remind you about engagement activities that they're going to be uh, Thursdays from 5 to 6 is when we're going to be arranging these uh, activities. And one of the other things you can do is to submit a suggested question that you think we should use uh, for question of the day. The TAs told me they've already got a bunch of student suggestions. Uh, and it mentions here how you can get an engagement credit for having a question that we end up picking. So, you know, make suggestions. Uh, maybe we'll pick your question, which would be kind of fun. Uh, and you get an engagement credit, which is a tiny little bit of credit uh, that would go along, I mean, that, that would uh, uh, be the reward for doing that. Uh, something just changed on my screen. I was just going to see, oh, that's nice. Okay, I, uh, I have a, a larger screen where I can see uh, what's on the, the screen over here. So that's kind of helpful that that just came up for me. So uh, anyway, uh, let me go ahead. What else did I wanted to mention to you? Oh, the... Homework one is out, so uh, information is here for the specification and so forth of homework one. I talked about that in the Wednesday lecture. Reminder that this calendar link is where I'm putting lots of resources. Like last time we did that figure program and there were the different versions, everything in Maine, you know, having methods for structure and then using methods to also eliminate redundancy. So those are those three different versions of figure one, figure two, and figure three. Uh, the lecture video is there, slides, in case you wanted to review. So uh, every lecture, at the end of the lecture, I'm going to go ahead and post these extra resources. So you'll see this calendar filling up uh, as the quarter goes on. Uh, and uh, we have information now under course staff. A uh, reminder that that's where that uh, anonymous feedback form is, if you want to send me anonymous feedback my information, and now we have the TA's information there as well uh, with their email addresses uh, and their names and pictures. Okay, that was tons of announcements. We really ate up a good chunk of time, but I think we'll be okay. Uh, we'll be able to get through stuff that I wanted to do today. So let me switch over to JGRASP. What we're going to be doing is moving into material from Chapter 2. and. Uh, let, this is uh, material for homework two. This is not material for homework one. So we're, got, we're doing new material to get ready for homework two. So chapter two has a lot of detail in it. And I would try not to worry about all of the details in chapter two. Uh, it's always there as a resource for you to go and look things up if you needed to kind of remind yourself of the details. Worry more about the concepts, you know, and I'm going to try to uh, highlight what are those different ideas, the different terminology, the different concepts. That's the most important thing. 
And especially in today's lecture, we're going to do lots of little examples. I think it's best to sit back and kind of absorb and, and uh, make sure that you're understanding the main ideas, even if some of the details t you know, don't quite sink in yet. There's still time to learn these details. So chapter two uh, is going to talk a lot about data. And in particular, it's going to talk about uh, numeric data. So we're going to be doing computations with numbers as kind of a starting point. We're going to be learning later uh, how to deal with things that are more typical in Java, what are known as objects in Java. But we won't be doing that until we get to chapter three in our homework three. Um, I, I wanted to begin by mentioning a certain idea that uh, is uh, relevant to the Java, relative, re relevant to programming, but actually it's an idea that, uh, that is independent of programming. It's uh, something uh, uh, that uh, everybody understands. I want to talk about the idea, uh, the difference between discrete quantities and continuous quantities. And it may be uh, that you, you don't even realize that you know about this. Everybody knows about this. So if you think about the words many, and if you think about the words much, those are words in English that make this distinction between discrete things and continuous things. So if I was going to think about uh, brothers and sisters. How many brothers and sisters do you have, for example? You have zero of them, or one of them, or two of them, or three of them. You don't have 2.65 brothers and sisters. And so if I were to say, you know, so I say, how many brothers and sisters do you have? Listen to how it sounds wrong if I say, how much brothers and sisters do you have? I mean, it's just, you know, you can tell uh, it, it sounds wrong, you know, when I say something like that. Uh, continuous quantities are things that can vary by tiny amounts. You know, uh, weight, for example, is something that's a continuous quantity. You can weigh 140 pounds uh, one week. You know, on the next week you weigh uh, 139.999, and the diet must be working because you know, this in infinitesimal little difference. So, in a continuous quantity, you can have tiny little differences that are that are meaningful. Uh, and you know, you again, if I said to you, how many do you weigh? I mean, it's just, it sounds wrong to kind of hear that. Uh, there's other words that we use for this too. The word fewer uh, versus the word less uh, is uh, supposed to make this distinction as well. Although I think in English, that's going away. I think people are using the word fewer not as often as they used to. Uh, I go to grocery stores and I'll see a sign, you know, that, that, that says uh, uh, express lane, 15 items or less. And I feel like going up to them and saying, 15 items or fewer, you know, it's not, not less. It's not an appropriate place to use less. But I think they want you know, their sign to be shorter. So they tend to, to do it that way. Well, and, and as I said, I think this, this distinction, you know, the fewer and less one is not, is not used as much anymore. But I think much and many is something that people still kind of can hear with their ear that it sounds wrong if you, if you misuse it. Now. Uh, for discrete quantities, it isn't always the case, but it's often the case that we associate this with integer quantities, like with those brothers and sisters, zero of them, one of them, two of them. And for the, uh, the uh, continuous quantities, we kind of often associate this with real numbers. Uh, in, in engineering, actually, what you would find is that, uh, uh, that this, these tend to correspond to what we call digital technologies and these tend to correspond to what we call analog technologies. And uh, people involved in engineering tend to know that the analog technologies are mostly the older technologies and that most things are kind of going towards the digital technologies. So anyway, that was just kind of, the, I wanted to mention that distinction. Oh, maybe I'll mention one last thing, which is that calculus is kind of the culmination of continuous mathematics. So if you, know, if you, you learned a lot about continuous mathematics in your K-12 experience, when you get to calculus, you're kind of you know, topping it off with this ultimate use of continuous math. I don't know whether you consider this good news or bad news, but I'll mention we don't use continuous math that much in computer science. You know, a few places here and there, but you know, mostly uh, we use the mathematics of the integers uh, in computer science. So uh, an example might be something like combinatorics, you know, uh, counting things. Uh, if you did uh, exercises with uh, factorials, for example, in your K-12 education, that's kind of closer to the math that we tend to use in computer science. Okay, 
Well, that was kind of, I wanted to, to mention that terminology. Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be uh, scooching this up again. I mentioned before that there's a bar here that separates these two different windows. And I'm gonna scooch this up a bit. Uh, I'm gonna be using this side window as well. And it has a bar too that allows me to scooch it when I, when I click on it and drag it. I can kind of change that bar you know, to different kinds of positions. So I'll be doing that somewhat during the lecture today. Um, so I wanted us to, to switch into something that's known as the interactions pane in Java, um, in JGrasp. Uh, so this, uh, I, I went to the lower window here and clicked on this thing called interactions. Uh, uh, my co-author and I love the interactions pane. We've, you know, we, we, we used to use a, a programming environment called Dr. Java, and the main reason we used it is that it had an interactions window. Uh, we ended up meeting the, the, the guy who does JGrasp, a fellow named James Cross, and we told him we liked JGrasp, but it didn't have an interactions uh, window, so we weren't gonna use it. So he went out and made an interactions window for JGrasp for us. I mean, I think uh, James Cross really likes us as customers. He, uh, he, every new release of JGrasp seems to be a little bit more uh, oriented towards the way we teach. I mean, I'm, it seems like he's looking up in my textbook the pictures that I draw because he seems to be trying to make JGRASP match you know, what I do with teaching. So that's pretty, pretty nice for us. The interactions pane actually is something now that comes standard with Java. This was something that was part of Java 9, so relatively late you know, the, to come to Java. But they, in, in standard Java, it's known as something called the J shell. So all of you have a J shell on your computer, whether you're using JGrasp or not. And in the fifth edition for the textbook, one of the changes that we made throughout the book is that we put lots of little J shell uh, snapshots, you know, because we think this is a really great way of teaching, is to use this kind of an interactive environment. It's like having a conversation with Java. Well, let me show you. I mean, uh, let me come down here. If I type two plus two, it's kind of like I'm saying, hey, Java, what do you think of two plus two? And Java says, I think that's four. You know, so it gives us a response. So it's a nice little way to have an interactive uh, session uh, with, uh, with, in this case, with JGrasp in the interactions pane uh, and to experiment with things. So a lot of what's gonna happen in the lecture today is you're gonna wonder what happens if you did this, what happens if you did that. And uh, I mean, I love having students in the lecture hall so that you can ask those questions and we just can't do that. But you can go into JGrasp and do these things yourself. So you can kind of go in here type in little things, I wonder what this would do. You know, give it a try, see what it does. Well, I wanted uh, to mention a couple of things here. One of them is that Java cares a lot about types. You know, what type of data are you working with? We're gonna see this in everything that we do here, starting in chapter two and throughout, is that we're always gonna have to be thinking about the type of data. We're gonna have to tell Java what types of data that we're working with. You know, you'll see that as we move through the these examples today. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention then is that uh, I wanted to first talk about the idea of expressions. You know, and this is the order in which chapter two does things as well. So this is the first kind of big concept is expressions. Uh, oh, actually, before I do that, let me talk a little bit, I mean, relative to this idea of the types. I wanted, uh, I don't tend to use this workbench feature very much, but I wanted to do it quickly uh, I wanted to type in a 42 and say go, so that that way JGrasp is showing me kind of what does it think about a 42, and it shows me that it has the value 42, and it's of type int. So that's a type in Java, int, int, short for integer, and that's used for discrete quantities. So that's kind of that, that discrete idea. It's something of type int. Let me come down here and type 36.8 and do a go. And so what it's showing me here is that I have something 36.8 of type double. So uh, Java lets you, I mean the, the, uh, the JGrasp is letting us know what the types of those things are. Uh, we're gonna have to be very careful when we uh, write our code that we are thinking about those different types. So this is, a, this is a, a continuous type, not an integer type, not a discrete type like int. The word double, it's a weird word. I think it'd be better if they called it real, you know, something like that. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes there's a word called float, you know, or floating, floating point is the idea. Some people have used that term. Um, this is, it's a very weird reason why this is true. I'll just briefly mention kind of where this comes from. Um, so uh, uh, th there was a programming language called C that was invented in the early 1970s and became very popular among a lot of programmers. Uh, then there was a language C++ that came along and they wanted to convince C programmers to want to use C++. So one of the things they did is that they borrowed tons of the syntax and conventions from C. They just made it compatible with C++. So C and C++, which are two of the most popular programming languages you know, in the world, uh, have the, this common uh, set of, of ideas that date all the way back to the early 1970s. When they came up with Java, they, didn't, they wanted to make it popular too, so they decided to copy lots of C and C++ things. So these names, int and double, go all the way back to C and C++. These, this is Java matching C and C++. I mean, I guess the good news is that you're learning things that are applicable in those other languages by learning this. Java does have a type that's known as float, and double is double the precision of a float. It's kind of like a double float. <laughs> so that's where that word comes from, is that it has uh, more accuracy than a simple float. Uh, you don't have to worry about where the words come from. For, from, for our purposes, uh, when you type in something that looks like an integer quantity, it's gonna be of type int, and when you type in something with a decimal point, it's gonna be considered to be of type double. So that's the, the, the thing to remember. Um, I, th I thought I'd briefly show you, this distinction is really an important distinction. I mean, these things are very different. They're stored very different on the computer. So uh, JGRASP has little viewers for this. I can view the numeric version of this. And what it's letting me see is that in base 10 decimal, it's 42. It's showing it to me in base 16, what's known as hexadecimal, base eight, what's known as octal, uh, and binary, uh, base two, you know, with zeros and ones. These are the actual zeros and ones that are stored on the computer to represent the number 42. Um, there's a, a couple of things to, to notice about this or to realize about this. One of them is that integer quantities are stored exactly. Every single digit of the integer is stored. So, uh, uh, but the, the problem with that, you can kind of see there's some, some ones here. You can imagine that as the number gets bigger, you get ones over here, ones over here, ones over here. It moves over and over and over, but there's a limited amount of space. So at some point, you're gonna run out of zeros and ones, so there's a cap on kind of how big of an integer value you can store on the computer. So it's stored exactly, you know, that's really good that, it, that there's no loss of information, but there's a limitation on how big of an integer you can store. Floating point numbers like double, double have a decimal point, and the right way of thinking of it is that it's stored more the way that you would think about doing scientific notation. So, you know, in scientific notation, we would refer to this as something like 3.68 times 10 to the first. So uh, the, the technical terms for that is that there's a mantissa, the 3.68, and an exponent, the 10 to the first. Uh, so you might imagine that's how it's stored, is a 3.68 and a 10 to the first, but, you know, hey, that would be so human-centric of you, you know, with 10 fingers and 10 toes to imagine that, that it's gonna be stored in base 10. Uh, it is stored as, a, as a, a mantissa and an exponent, but in base two. So let me go ahead at the numeric representation of this, and it's big, there's lots of stuff here. It's showing us, you know, this, don't freak out about this. There's, you know, the, all of the information that's here, but it's kind of showing you here that it's 1.1499 is the mantissa, times two to the fifth. So the exponent here is two to the fifth. It's stored in base two rather than being stored in base 10. But um, the, the thing to know about that, that then is that you, you know, because you're storing an exponent separately from a mantissa, you can store much larger numbers. You know, if you want to store you know, something like 10 to the 90th or something, you can do that because it can keep track of the exponent. It's a separate thing. But it's not gonna store it exactly. 
So it's going to store it as an approximation. So kind of int is stored exactly, but has a limited range. Double is, has a huge range because of the exponent ability, but it's not stored exactly. And we're going to see some funny things that happen with doubles as a result of the fact that you don't store every digit, that you don't store it exactly. Okay, well that's just kind of to make the point of these two different types uh, and understanding a little bit about them. Uh, so let me come back down here and uh, expressions. So expressions would involve, you know, like I did the two plus two, that involves two integer constants and the operator plus, you know, an addition operator. Uh, if you wanted to do multiplication, we use the times operator, the star, three times four. Um, uh, so uh, expressions basically involve, you know, the simplest kind of expression would be a constant, but then more complicated expressions involve, you know, uh, combinations of constants and operators. So here I'm using two operators, a plus and a times. And I think all of you probably know exactly how this is going to turn out, that it's going to do the three times four first to get a 12, and it's going to add two to it to get a 14. But there's something at play there that's, uh, that's important to understand. In programming, we refer to this as precedence of operators. You know, so that's kind of the term that we use for it. Uh, in math classes, they tend to refer to this as order of operations. Uh, when I was in school, they taught us my dear Aunt Sally. I think now people like to do PEMDAS, which some people do as please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, you know, a, a mnemonic, a, a, a way of remembering, you know, what the order is. So you've probably had some experience with this idea before, but I have to kind of tell you how it works in Java. So Java has various levels of precedence for different kinds of operators. So there are some operators that are known as the multiplicative operators uh, that have the higher level of precedence when we're dealing with numbers. And the multiplicative operators in include times for multiplication, slash for division, and then there's this weird little percent sign, which is an operator, what we call the mod operator. I'm going to describe that in a minute. Uh, but so there's three of these multiplicative operators. They have a higher level of precedence. Uh, and then there are the additive operators, plus and minus, you know, which have a lower level of precedence. So that's why uh, when I had that 2 plus 3 times 4, uh, you know that the multiplication has the higher level of precedence, and so it's going to do that first uh, and come up with a 12, and then do the additive operator, add in the 2 and get a 14. Uh, if you want to override precedence, you can use uh, parentheses. That's the P in PEMDAS, is to use parentheses. Uh, so uh, you can say, uh, no, 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 I wanted to add the two and the three first and then do a multiplication by four. So you always have the ability to override with parentheses. And what I would say, you know, is that when you're learning all of this, I wouldn't worry too much, you know, about extra parentheses. You know, if it helps you to, you know, if you're not quite sure, you know, throw in an extra set of parentheses. It tends to, it tends to be easier to have extra parentheses without a bug than to have some weird subtle bug because you didn't include the parentheses, you know, and it led to an error. So different levels of precedence. Within a given level of precedence, Java evaluates left to right. And, uh, you know, a lot of times that doesn't matter. Two plus three plus four, it kind of doesn't matter whether you do the two plus three first or whether you do the three plus four first. But if you were going to do something like 20 minus 7 minus 4, it does matter the order in which you do these. So the, it's two minus operators, so they have the same level of precedence, so they're evaluated left to right. That's Java's rule. So it's going to do 20 minus 7 first, and that's going to be a 13. Minus 4, I think, gives a 9. Let's check it out. Yeah, there's a 9. Uh, again, you could use parentheses to override. Um, I did something a second ago and I didn't explain it, and I'm about to do it again. So let me mention that when you're in the interactions pane, uh, it has a history feature. So I'm going to hit the up arrow key. So I hit the up arrow button, and it brought back 
the thing that I had on the line above. So that's kind of a nice way of having, uh, you know, doing a variation of what you did a moment ago. Oops, I didn't want to do it that way. That's already what it does. Uh, if I did it this way, then I would be overriding that left to right rule and I'd be saying, no, no, I want to take seven minus four first and then subtract uh, and get a three and subtract that from a 20 and I'd get a 17. So that's um, kind of the left to right rule. Uh, let's talk a little bit about division. So uh, if I did 18 divided by three, it gives you something that I think is not surprising, six, you know? How many times does three go into 18? Six times. Uh, but how about 20 divided by three? The thing about this one, we have an int divided by an int, and it doesn't go evenly, you know? So when you divide 20 by three, you don't get an, you know, something that's an exact int. So what does Java do? It's a little bit odd what Java does. Java decides to give you an answer in the domain of int. So it's going to kind of truncate the answer. We would think of this as it's six point something or other, right? There's six and change. But you could just think of it as it eliminates everything after the decimal point. Uh, or another way of thinking of it, you know, is how many times does three go evenly into 20? Uh, and it goes six times evenly. It would be six point something or other. In fact, if I say 20.0 divided by 3.0, now I'm using doubles by using the point zero. You know, even though they happen to coincide with an int value, because I'm using the point zeros, it's gonna use double division, and there I can see what it's really equal to. There's a bit of that weirdness that it's rounding off that final digit because uh, it has limited uh, uh, accuracy. It's kind of, it ran out of digits at some point and decided to just show you that the last digit would be considered a seven. So anyway, when you do integer, an int divided by an int, it gives you an integer, six. But you might wanna know then, well, okay, three times six gives you 18, so what was left over? What was unaccounted for? What's the remainder? What's kind of the extra bit that you didn't account for? And that's what that other operator is for, what we call the mod operator, 20 mod three. It says what's left over when you divide 20 by three, and the answer is gonna be two. That was kind of the unaccounted for part. So uh, that's what mod is for. We're, we're gonna see a lot of interesting applications of mod before we're done. Uh, I wanted to point out uh, with doubles, so here I had used a double and a double. You know, you can do all sorts of things with doubles. I wanted to point out that here's an interesting combination with a double where when we add 2.5 and 3.5, it comes up with 6.0. It comes up with something that coincides with an integer. You know, it happens to be something that is an integer, but notice how it's got the point zero. So it keeps it in the domain of double. So that's kind of a, a double version of 6.0, not the int version of 6.0. All right. Well, then there's kind of the question of what happens when we mix ints and doubles. So what if I did five divided by 3.0? So there's an int here and there's a double here. There's a very simple rule that Java has. If it sees an operator being applied where there's an int and a double, it turns the int into a double. It's called promoting. It promotes the int into a double. So it gives you the same answer as if you had said 5.0 divided by 3.0. So uh, uh, an int double combination gives you something like that. Um, what would you get if you did five slash three times 2.4? You know, so again, a combination of ints and doubles. You could place your bet. So what's it gonna do when it has five slash three times 2.4? And what we end up with is uh, 2.4. 2.4, how did that happen? Well, remember, it, uh, it applies these various rules. We have division and we have multiplication and they have the same level of precedence. So it goes left to right. So the first thing it does is it evaluates that little sub-expression. Five divided by three, an int divided by an int. Do you see a double in there? I don't see a double in there. So uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't look ahead to see that there's a double coming later. So that gets turned into how many times does three go evenly into five? Once. And then what's one times 2.4? 2.4. All right, a few more details, lots of stuff here. You can take strings and use the plus 
to do something called concatenation, to, to put the two strings together into one string. In fact, you can even do things like this. You can do hello plus 38, a string plus a number. You can add a string to anything in Java, and Java converts the other thing into a textual equivalent. So it turns 38 into a text version, and we get a string hello 38. So that turns out to be kind of interesting. All right, that was a whole lot about expressions and precedence. Again, a lot of detail. You don't have to memorize all the detail. The main thing is to remember the basic ideas there of expressions and operators and precedence. Um, I wanted to mention, you know, normally at this point I would say there's going to be a question on the midterm where we ask you to do these kinds of expressions and tell us what they evaluate to. Uh, and that would be your motivation is this going to be on the midterm. Let me uh, give a minor advertisement for it in that I think it's really helpful for you to learn how these expressions work. Uh, it'll help you in your Java programming because then you'll understand you know, how to put together the right expressions in the lines of code that you write. But I also think it's just a good uh, experience, a good mental experience. You're learning about algorithmic thinking. You're learning that the computer has a very simple set of rules that it applies consistently. And every person can learn those rules. Everybody can learn to think like the computer in understanding those expressions. So uh, it's my strong recommendation that you do what we call these expressions problems, uh, even though we aren't going to have an exam where we test you on it. OK. Uh, I want to talk about uh, what are known as variables. So this is kind of the next major idea. Uh, when you have a variable, the first thing that you need to do is to declare your variable. And I'm going to do that here. So suppose I wanted to have a variable called x that I wanted to work with. And I'm going to scooch this down. You'll see why in a second. So if I'm going to work with this variable x, Java wants to know the type of this variable before you can work with it. So I have to say to Java, hey, Java, I want to work with a variable called x of type int. And so I say int x, and I end it with a semicolon to declare that variable x. And notice how it appears up here. So this little upper window in the upper left corner shows you your various variables and what values they have. There's an x of type int that's currently uninitialized. I haven't given it a value. So that's kind of one part of it, is declaring the variable. The other part of it is assigning it a value. That's kind of the next thing that we want to do. And we do that with the equal sign. We say something like x equals 42. And notice that JGrass put a 42 up here. It turned it to red. JGrass has this convention of tending to turn things to red as a way to draw your eye so that you'll notice that something changed there. So there's an x that's 42 now. Uh, this, using the equal sign, is really an unfortunate choice. Um, we used to use a language called, a teaching language called Pascal, where you said colon equals, you know, so that was at least a little bit different. I kind of wish they would do something like this, you know, something that looks like an arrow going in the backwards direction. Because we're going to see that one of the things to understand about assignment statements is that Java looks on the right hand side first and sees what that evaluates to, and whatever that value is, it goes into the variable that's listed on the left-hand side. Uh, that's not what, what Java does, though. This was kind of borrowing, again, the C and C++ convention. So we say x equals 42 to assign it a value. And then I could say x equals 17, so I've reassigned it to a different value. So you can assign it a value as much as you want, a variable. You know, you can change it. Now, most programmers wouldn't have done it in two steps the way I did here. Most programmers would say, like if you're going to do a y, they'd say something like int y equals 13. You know, they would just do both things at once. They do the declaration and the assignment all on the same line, which is fine if you wanted to do it that way. Just be careful that, you, you know, then you have to remember that if I said int y equals 13 again, you know, that, that's again a declaration and an assignment, and it gets mad. y is already defined. So you only declare things once. You declare the variable once, and then you assign it as many times as you want. I think of the analogy, it's like checking into a hotel. You know, you check in to get a room key or whatever, and then you can go in and out of your room as many times as you want. But this is kind of like going back to the front desk and trying to check in again. And they say, hey, you already checked in. I already gave you a key. You know, why are you bothering me? You know, so uh, what we would want to do here is we could say y equals 94. So, 
Uh, we can reassign as many times as we want, but only one declaration. So uh, that's one of the things to remember. Um, another way in which this is kind of not like uh, uh, the equal sign in mathematics is suppose I said that int sum is x plus y. So x plus, you know, sum is now computed to be the sum of those two variables. Uh, if I reset x to be uh, 19, then sum is no longer the sum of these two variables. So you have to understand that assignment is not setting up some kind of equality that would be maintained. What it's doing is it's saying, I want you to do a certain change at a certain point in time. Uh, and so like at this point in time, sum is no longer x plus y. I'd have to reassign sum to be x plus y to get it uh, so that it, it represents the new sum. Let me show you a line that really makes this clear, kind of the, the most odd line of all of these. Suppose you said x equals x plus one. That's a really weird line of code, but actually it's a line of code that we execute often or some variation on it. So what it does is it looks at the right-hand side, remember I said it does that first, and it says, what's x plus one? Well, x is 19, x plus one is 20, and it says make that the new value of x. So watch, how, watch the 19 up here, and you'll see that it becomes 20. And I'm gonna use my little up arrow to get that back so I can execute it again. 21, 22, 23. Every time I execute that line of code, x goes up by one. This is something that we refer to as incrementing. So I'm incrementing a variable here. Uh, there's a corresponding x equals x minus one, which we refer to as decrementing. So we do incrementing and decrementing a lot. And here you can really see kind of what's going on there, you know, that, uh, that it's not equality. This is not representing equality. I wanted to mention two variations just so that uh, you know about them. So we often write lines of code like that x equals x plus one, or lines of code like x equals x times two, you know, doubling x, take the old x and multiply by two. There's a, a shorthand for this. Uh, again, you don't need to memorize it, but you might see it. So an equivalent to saying x equals x plus one is x plus equals one. So there's a special operator that you could kind of read as take x and add to it one, or take x and multiply it by two. So plus equals, times equals, those are some variations you know, of, the, of, of assignment that are available. They're in chapter two, they're in the notes. Again, I wouldn't worry too much about it for now. If you run into it, you know you can always look up the details when you see it. But there's another one that is important, because uh, we just use it a lot, uh, which is that uh, this incrementing and decrementing is so important that there are even more ways to do incrementing and decrementing. You can say x plus plus. So there's a special little operator plus plus uh, and you can see, you know, x went up, what, we're up to 95, I guess now, 96, you know, and x minus minus are operators that uh, increment and decrement. Uh, the chapter mentions that there are variations plus plus x and minus minus x, and that's something you really don't need to know or don't need to understand. Read it in the book if you're interested in understanding the difference between those. I'm gonna use the plus plus operator in such a way that it would never matter, you know, so that you would never need to understand this distinction uh, between what's called the pre-increment and the post-increment. So we'll just use the x plus plus form or the x minus minus form. Whoa, well, that was a lot of details to go over. Uh, again, as I said, worry more about the concepts. You wanna be thinking about variables, declaring variables, assigning variables, uh, the idea of incrementing, the idea of decrementing, kind of remembering that there's some variations, but we'll see it a lot. We'll see lots of examples of this. All right, uh, I wanna wrap up the lecture by going over an example program with you. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot we can do at this point in time, but I thought maybe a computation, numeric computation you might be interested in is what grade are you gonna get in the course? You know, so uh, we're only doing homework, so I've modified this from my usual example. I don't have a midterm and a final in here. Uh, I have a little comment. I'm indicating that homework one is worth 10 points. I'm letting you know that homework two is gonna be worth 16, and that homeworks three through eight will each be worth 20 points. 
There's also a section participation point uh, the score that's worth 20 points. So I'm adding up all of the possible points, 10 for homework one, 16 for homework two, six other homeworks worth 20, and 20 for the section. That's the possible points. And I'm just kind of doing a suppose. Suppose you got eight out of 10 on homework one, 14 out of 16 on homework two. Suppose you're gonna average 18 points on the other six homeworks and you're gonna get 20 out of 20 for section participation. You go at least seven times and get your full credit. So I take your homework score divided by the possible points, multiply it by 100 to turn it into a percentage, and then we'll report it. So let's see you know, if you were gonna do that. Let's figure out how you're gonna do in the course. We will end the interactions pane and go ahead and run this program. And you're gonna get a zero and fail the course. Uh, <laughs> That's not good news. Uh, why is that happening? We want to understand. So let me show you something here that's going to be really useful while you're working on your programs. I'm going towards this first line here. I'm going to position towards the beginning of the window, and you'll see a little red stop sign appear. I'm going to click. So I kind of clicked right there. That stop sign is used in conjunction with a debugger. There's a, so there are debugging capabilities in JGrasp. To debug, instead of using the run icon, you use the ladybug icon. So I'm gonna click on that. And what I'm saying is I want you to stop here, JGrasp. And so it's stopped before it's executed anything uh, so that I can kind of watch what's going on. So this window is used to control the debugger. Uh, this is the simplest command to give in the debugger, to step, st one step at a time, one line of code, one line of code, one line of code. I'm going to do that. So it's positioned here where we got the homework total line of code, and I'm going to say step. So it executed it, and we can see that the total possible points is 166. Let's see what our homework score was, 150. And then we'll see what it computed homework to be, zero. All right, why did that happen? Uh, well, we can check it out in the interactions pane. What did it do? It computed that Homework score was 150, homework total was 166, so it had 150 divided by 166, and it multiplied that by 100, and it got a zero. Why did that happen? Well, you might think, well, it's because I used an integer 100 here. I should have used 100.0. So maybe I could do down here 100. I'll do the same thing, but I'll do, instead of this, I'll do 100.0. Maybe that'll fix it. No because uh, it turns out that having the 100.0 at the end doesn't fix this other problem. If I take 150 divided by 166, that's an int divided by an int. And how many times does 166 go evenly into 150? Zero times. So I want to do something like, you know, 150.0 divided by 166.0. You know, so that was kind of the thing that I was looking for. But because I have two ints, that's not working. Often what students recommend to fix this is to change these ints to doubles. And that would fix it. But let me just kind of warn you, don't do that because that would be a style violation. So in terms of style, we know that these are integers. And we want you to kind of keep things that are integers as integers. Or you might lose a style point. So, the chapter talks about something known as typecasting, where you could say, turn this into a double. So that would be a way to do it. Don't worry about the casting yet. We're not gonna deal with this until we hit homework four. Uh, there's kind of a simpler fix, which is instead of having the 100.0 at the end, I can have 100.0 here. Uh, and by doing it that way, this is a double times an int. So that kind of, so let me, and my debug that I was doing there. It gave me the information that I wanted, but I don't need it anymore. And let's try running it now. Oh, let me, uh, I didn't hit compile. So we'll recompile and run. That's a better score. That's a better indication. That would get you above a three point, uh, at least a 3.5. Uh, let me show you one last little thing with this last minute that we've got here. Suppose that you did uh, engagement activities. So I just kind of wanted to show you how that would factor in. Suppose you did three of them. What I've said is that instead of using your raw homework score, I'm gonna take the homework score plus your engagement activities divided by three. 
a third of a homework point as a kind of a bonus for all of your engagement activities. So let's see, we had, what did we have there when we ran it before? We were getting a, a 90.36, ah, so you could see a tiny little bit of credit, 90.96. You know, what happens if we did four engagement activities? What would happen? Instead of 90.96, we'd get 90.96. What if we had, uh, up here, what if we had five engagement activities? Oops, that's not where I wanted that. I wanted that up here. What if we had five engagement activities? We compile and run. Instead of 90.96, we have 90.96. How come it's not recording my increase? Well, you probably have figured it out already. An int divided by an int. I wanted to divide by 3.0 in order to be able to get it to, to give you your third of a point. Ah. That's better. Now you can kind of see how that works. So I'm going to post this little program on the calendar for today in case you wanted to look at that yourself. Um, and otherwise, that's all I had for the lecture today. Thanks. <laughs>